Okay. So, um, good morning, everyone, to another edition of Jews and the News. And I wanted to talk um, today about uh, what is extremely controversial and volatile in uh, American society today. And just, <clears throat> it's ongoing, but, um, but it, came to the, uh, it came to the head last week when a draft of Justice Samuel Alito's uh, position on Roe v. Wade was leaked uh, to an online uh, news source called Politico. So I don't want to get in. I don't want to get into the politics of that. I don't want to get into the uh, how good a uh, case Roe v. Wade was in order to set the precedent for abortion. I want to instead just talk in general about abortion from a Jewish perspective. Okay, so if you're if you're looking for details on Samuel Alito's legal reasoning, you came to the wrong place. If you are looking for uh, an understanding of the legality and reasoning of Roe v. Wade from 1973, you came to the wrong place. But if you're looking for a Jewish understanding of whether abortion is permitted or not, that's what we're going to be discussing today. Okay, so um, let me tackle this subject this way. So, abortion can be understood as both a legal concept and a religious concept. And because it's understood in both ways, right? It's a, it's, it's a medical procedure. Therefore, all medical procedures in America are uh, legislated by uh, medical review boards. And also, uh, so there's medical, there are medical standards around all medical procedures. And then some are also legislated, like end of life issues or, uh, I don't know, some medications are legislated uh, through the Fruit, Food and Drug Administration and, and the CDC. So there are national federal government agencies involved in a variety of medical procedures, medications, etc. Abortion being one of them. So abortion in that way is a medical legal issue but it's also compounded by the fact that it's a religious issue too. All right. So for that, that makes it, that complicates matters for Americans, but as Jews, that shouldn't be seen as unusual because Jewish practice, our understanding of what we do every day from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to sleep is legislated by Jewish law. So it just so happens that everything that we would do over the course of the day, Jewishly is understood from a Jewish spiritual religious perspective. So that giving tzedakah, how we talk to our fellow human beings, how we relate to our employer, employee, etc., all of that has a Jewish perspective to it. 
So it's not unusual for us as Jews to understand that an issue is a Jewish issue. But for Americans, it's not so usual to understand an American issue from a religious perspective. Okay? So, the, uh, so that's number one. Number two is how we understand everything Jewishly. And this is just a reminder, again, from how I've, I've taught classes like this over the years. And it's, it's good to consistently emphasize and reinforce this message. Unlike some ultra-Orthodox Jews, Judaism is not Torah true. There are arch ultra Orthodox Jews who claim to be Torah true Jews. In the scheme of things, that is an absurd, false statement. Because the Torah true Judaism that they are professing. I'm not denigrating them. I'm just pointing this out historically and uh, from a um, just an overall 4,000 year perspective. Jews have never been Torah true, meaning Jews do not follow exactly and literally what the Torah tells us to do. We have never done that, and we still don't do that. The Torah provides a framework with very general statements, sometimes specific, but mostly general statements about civil law and religious law and worship service. We have no idea in practice how Israelites practiced what the Torah taught. The rest of the Bible highlights certain things that happen in the temple, but never really gives us examples of how Israelites were fulfilling what the Torah was teaching. In the time of the rabbis, 2,000 years ago until 1,500 years ago, the rabbis transformed Israelite religion into rabbinic Judaism, which one of the major foundational principles is interpreting the Torah to derive rabbinic Jewish principles. So interpretation is a hallmark of rabbinic Judaism. And uh, understanding a phrase from the Torah in and putting it into practice is how the rabbis worked. So that, for example, I'll give two examples, two quick examples. When the Torah teaches that when, um, that when we gouge out someone's eye, our eye should be gouged out as punishment. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, wound for wound. The Torah seems to be teaching specifically. So I'm just looking at my Zoom screen. If I chop off Jules's arm, Jules in response can chop off my arm. That's simple as that. I injure Jules, he injures me as punishment for my injuring him. But the rabbis never understood eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, literally. They said from the very beginning, 
in rabbinic Judaism 2000 years ago, they said eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, wound for a wound is to be understood as monetary compensation. And monetary compensation is different for every person who does the injury and every person who is injured. So Jules is a retired lawyer. If I chop off his arm, in the scheme of things, he could, if he were still working as a lawyer, he could still work as a lawyer. So the value of his arm is different than if Jules were a baseball player, where you need both arms in order to swing the bat or to catch the ball in the infield or the outfield. You need two arms to do that. Recognizing, of course, the famous one-armed pitcher from the New York Yankees, Jim Abbott. Somehow he was able to pitch with only one arm and he actually threw a no-hitter, but I digress. The point is that the rabbis understood the value of the arm relative to the use of the arm by the person who was injured by the loss of the arm and then by extension, all the other injuries, okay? So Jules's arm, again, I'm using Jules as the example here. Jules, as a retired lawyer, the value of his arm is less than the value of Bryce Harper's arm, okay? So you get the, the point, and that's how the rabbis understand the value of arm, and also, if I were a one-armed person knocking off Jules's arm, would it be fair, the rabbis ask, that I lose my other arm as punishment, therefore being totally armless? Okay, so these are the examples, and I'm just touching the surface of the, of the lengthy discussion in I believe it's chapter eight of the tractate Baba Kama in the Mishnah, which uh, discusses all of these issues in great detail. But I give this as an example to highlight how Judaism works in that it never sees a statement as the only understanding of law about that issue. It always sees the interpretation and the nuance and the complexity of the issue in, and, and the rabbis freely go off on tangents to discuss everything related to that particular issue. So that's, that's just one example of many examples of taking a statement for them to, from the Torah, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, wound for wound, etc and declaring that it's not to be understood that way. And these are all the layers that we are adding to this so we understand fully what it means, what does injury law look like in rabbinic Judaism. The second example is of how rabbinic Judaism works is that they even create new laws out of whole cloth. For example, lighting candles on Friday night to usher in Shabbat or lighting candles on any night to usher in a holiday. Torah says nothing about that. Absolutely nothing. I, I challenge each and every one of you to find a place in the Torah, a verse in the Torah where it says you must light candles to usher in the Sabbath, or you must light candles to usher in the holiday. It does not say it. The rabbis create law, and in this regard, religious law and civil law are equal for the rabbis, right? Injury law is civil law, has nothing necessarily to do with religious law, but it's an understanding 
of how we relate to each other because we're all created in God's image and therefore civil law is religious law, Jewishly. But lighting Shabbos candles, everyone agrees, is religious law. It's religious ritual practice. And that the rabbis are willing to create out of whole cloth. And also another example of this is Hanukkah. It's a mitzvah to light candles for Hanukkah. I challenge you to find a reference to Hanukkah in the Torah. It's impossible because Hanukkah, the events surrounding Hanukkah in 165 BCE occurred a thousand years after the Torah was given at Mount Sinai. So I give these examples to highlight how Judaism works, that Judaism is based on rabbinic Judaism, which is based on the Torah, but not only the Torah. Rabbinic Judaism is based on the rabbi's understanding of the Torah. So when any Jew claims to be a Torah true Jew, you should automatically roll their eyes, roll your eyes at them, because that is not an accurate Jewish statement of what a Jew is today. Okay, so I, I cannot state that point more emphatically than I'm stating it now. So Judaism today is based on rabbinic Judaism. The rabbis of 2000 years ago to 1500 years ago and the two major law codes, the Mishnah and the Talmud. So from 2000 years ago to 1500 years ago when the Talmud was edited, that 500 year pre period created Judaism as we know it, which used the Torah as the foundation for the rabbis creation of Judaism as we know it, the, their ideology, their interpretation of the Torah. Okay, so that is, that is important also for now as we look at the issue about abortion. So we'll take the, this issue and understand it, how the rabbis understand it, okay? There is nothing about abortion in the Torah, okay? So when an issue arises for the rabbis to talk about where it doesn't appear in the Torah at all, then the rabbis have to use other things that could impact the discussion about this new topic, okay? So the new topic is abortion. Torah doesn't talk about it. Rabbis then look to other sources that will help explain that particular topic. So there are two things in the Torah, among many others. I'm not an expert on abortion in Jewish law, but I know enough to be able to teach this and provide us with the background that we need so that we can have an intelligent conversation with other people. That gets to a whole other cl class that we can discuss about whether what is the nature of intelligent conversations today in American society and whether people are actually open to hearing an other side or another interpretation from one's own, okay? So that's, that's a topic for another time. Okay, so abortion. We have two sources that I just wanna talk about. Just because we have only an hour to talk about this, we can't talk about everything uh, related to this. First, and I brought this up on Shabbat, it is extremely important for us to know that the sixth of the 10 of the 10 commandments, the sixth commandment says in Hebrew, lo tirtzach, which translates literally, do not murder. So if you look at an old translation of the Bible, a King James translation, it will say, thou shalt not kill. That is a wrong translation because we have to understand that there is a difference between, a, an important difference between killing someone and murdering someone. As I talked a little bit on Shabbat, murder implies premeditation, okay? So I'll use Jules as an example again. On my Zoom screen, 
Jules is on the upper left of my screen. So if I, if I planned to murder Jules, I have a plan, I go to his house with a weapon in hand and I murder Jules, I would, I, that, that is murder. If there were two witnesses there who told me, what are, who asked me, what are you doing? And I said, I'm about to murder Jules Fink. They said, they, they need to, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing it this way for a reason. The two witnesses say to me, if you, do, if you murder Jules Fink, do you know that you will be subject to um, execution under Jewish law? And I say, yes, I recognize that. I, and I disregard the warning and I still murder Jules Fink then I would be subject to, to execution under Jewish law by, by the Sanhedrin, okay? So these are, are uh, elements that the rabbis add to an understanding of murder. If, however, I happen to visit Jules and we get into a heated argument and Jules slaps me on the face, and then I punch him in the chest, knowing that uh, the Jules is not exactly heart healthy, uh, but he's poo poo poo, he's doing well. But if I punch him in the chest and he drops dead, that would be called killing Jules, not murdering Jules, right? So just to understand, I bring this uh, ridiculous example just to help us understand the difference between murder and killing, okay? And Jules could even more, as a retired lawyer, explain the differences between murder in the first degree, second degree, third degree, versus manslaughter and, uh, and all the degrees of manslaughter, okay? The rabbis understood those as well. So knowing that the uh, sixth, commandment says lo tirtzach, do not murder, and it does not say do not kill. We clearly understand then, according to the rabbis, that killing is permitted under Jewish law. There are circumstances that can arise in life in which killing someone is okay, which therefore means that life the value of life is relative. This is an extremely important point because if the commandment was do not kill, then that would mean killing in any way is absolutely forbidden. So that would mean perhaps it would be forbidden to go to war and that if we were under attack, it would be forbidden to retaliate, if someone came to attack us, to kill us, clearly with a knife or a gun or some other dangerous weapon, it would be against the law to retaliate and to save ourselves. Life then across the board for a criminal, for a Hitler or anybody else, life is equal. Judaism unequivocally says life is relative and not equal, okay? There are circumstances that are arise in life in which, for example, in self-defense, it is perfectly acceptable to kill someone else in order to save our lives or kill someone else in order to save someone else's life. And I'll use Jules as an example again. Let's say Jules has a gun in his hand and he's aiming it at Robert, which on my screen, Robert is right below Jules. So Jules aims the gun at Robert, clear to me that Jules is about to murder or kill Robert. It is my responsibility to intervene and prevent Jules from doing that, even if it means killing Jules in the process in order to save Robert's life, okay? so. Life is relative. 
And the value of life, that I mean by that, the value of life is relative. So in this example, Jules' is life is, uh, is low compared to Robert's life because Jules was looked like he was about to kill Robert. So his life is, ex Jules's life is expendable in order to save Robert's life. In, these are important, extremely important distinctions and definitions to help us understand abortion. Because for some in America today, and for some religious definitions, life is equal across the board. And therefore, they, in, in some circles, the life of the fetus is equivalent in, in value to the life of the mother who is hosting the fetus. In Jewish law, that is never the case. Because not only have I just explained that in this example of Jules about to kill Robert and that I'm allowed to intervene and kill Jules to save Robert, that the value of life, there are different gradations of value of life. There is also another term here is the viability of life. And the rabbis understood that a fetus is not viable until it is born. And even some rabbis said a baby, so a fetus becomes a baby once it is born. A baby is not viable until 30, on the 31st day after it was born. Viability of life is outside of the womb. Inside the womb, the fetus is not viable. It may have human form, and the rabbis say a fetus has human form after 40 days. 40 days after conception, a fetus has human form. And so, but, but, but still, even though the fetus might have human form, it is not viable. And they give an example, this very graphic example, that if a fetus in the process of childbirth, the fetus, the fetus's head emerges, but not the entire body, or the legs emerge first, breach, but not the entire body, and the mother's life is, ex, as, is at stake, here's the graphic part, you're allowed to chop up this baby that in the process of being born in order to save the mother's life. Because here's another, another term that the baby here is considered in Hebrew, a rodef, a pursuer. A rodef is someone who is uh, attacking or about to attack someone who's therefore by attacking, their life is at stake. So in this example of Jules about to kill Robert and I'm intervening, Jules is the Rodaif. And if Robert is not able to protect himself from the Rodaif, then I or any other bystander or uh, someone in the area, it has the responsibility to intervene to protect someone from the Rodaif the pursuer. So in this example of the, of the mother in the process of childbirth and in the process of childbirth, the baby itself is, um, is uh, making the mother's life, putting the mother's life at risk, that childbirth, it, that the, the mother is at risk of losing her life. No question that the mother's life takes precedence over the baby's life. Not just because the baby is the pursuer, but also because of the viability. The babe, we don't know the baby is viable until the baby is born. And again, for some rabbis, 
Not until the baby is 30 day, 31 days old is the baby a viable life, okay? So three elements here. Life, the value of life is relative. There is the viability of life. And then there is the pursuer. These three elements are the key to understanding abortion. So clearly then, if the fetus is putting the mother's life at risk, no question abortion is not just allowed, but is mandated. Mother's life must be saved. The, the other, other elements here, baby, it's clear with all the tests that are done now when a woman is pregnant over the course of the pregnancy, sonograms, um, amniocentesis, blood work, all of this, we know so much about the viability of the fetus. God forbid fetus is discovered to have Tay-Sachs or some other genetic disease where it's incurable and the baby will die. Most, if not all, rabbinic sources say it is permitted to have an abortion. Wouldn't be mandated, but it would be permitted for the mother to have, for the parents to do an abortion for a fetus unequivocally determined to have an incurable disease. This, so I have an, an example of this in my time as your rabbi. Many years ago, when we were on Lockwood Drive, a couple came to me uh, in third term of pregnancy, clear that the baby just discovered to have a tumor growing on its spine outside of the body. So external tumor, not on the spine under the skin, but on the spine outside, unbelievable. If the baby were to be born, it would clearly be dead or die momentarily. Came to me, is an abortion okay? Third term, University of Maryland Hospital. Takes a while for the ethics board of the hospital, of any hospital, to allow a procedure. So third term abortion is rare because usually by then mothers know in second term, if not first term, that something's wrong with the baby or the mother decides to have an abortion for whatever other reason. And I'll get there in our discussion shortly. Uh, third term. So by the time the ethics board came back, she was in labor. So abortion wasn't an option, but it turned out uh, it was a stillbirth. So this tragic situations arise, okay? So for, for whether it's an incurable disease or some other condition with the baby, with the fetus, abortion is permitted if not mandated. Okay, so mandated if the pregnancy puts the mother's life at risk. Absolutely, no matter how far along, first term, second term, third term, fetus puts the mother's life at risk, abortion unequivocally mandated, must be done to save the mother's life. Abortion permitted if incurable or some other rare disease that would kill this child, like Tay-Sachs, Tay-Sachs children die by the time they're five at the latest. Some other disease like that to save the child, this, this fetus suffering as a baby and parents unendurable suffering, emotional, mental suffering as a parent to watch a child die without any, any help that you can do at all. Abortion is permitted. 
I, like I said, a majority of rabbis, Orthodox rabbis too, not just conservative rabbis, would permit abortion for that. The tricky part is abortion for choice. And th this, is, this is a key. So it's important. I guess the only political thing I will say is that pro-choice, pro-life, those, those um, blanket statements, it's so unfair to have a blanket statement like that. So is Judaism pro-life or pro-choice? The answer is yes to that either or question. And I'm not being flippant with that. It's because, because law and religious law is meant to be nuanced, okay? It's impossible to come up with a law that will cover 100% 100, 100 of all situations. It's impossible. Not all pregnancies are the same. Not all fetuses are the same. So it's impossible to legislate pregnancy law, abortion law for everyone, impossible. So there has to be room in the system to allow for unusual circumstances. There has to be in order for the system to work and in order for people to live within the system, right? So another statement is the laws, the covenant that is established uh, between God and the Jewish people at Mount Sinai, the covenant being the Torah, is meant to, you're supposed to live by them, not die by them. We live by these laws, not die by these laws. So therefore, how we understand the law, how our lives are enhanced and inspired, helps us to live. If the law works in the other way, that it only restricts our life and in fact imposes harm on our life, that's not a legal system. You can't live by that legal system. We're supposed to live by the laws, not die by them. So the, the rabbis in their great wisdom allowed and with their discussions that are in the Mishnah and mostly in the Talmud, they allowed us in later generations to understand what the issues were that what the what the important points that they brought to the discussion so that we can bring those same points if not newer points to the discussion in the future so for them the discussion of, of abortion was about the how life is is rel is the value of life is relative. The viability of life is a question. And uh, the pursuer, the, the, the idea of the pursuer. So adding these, these legal principles to the discussion help, uh, help us to help each individual woman while she is pregnant make the necessary religious and ethical choices that she needs to. Okay, so the, the, then the, 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 the final discussion about whether abortion is allowed for whatever reason. Judaism in general, no matter who we say we are, uh, uh, what denomination, Judaism in general, does not allow abortion as um, birth control, okay? So woman gets pregnant, it was a mistake. All things being equal, she's healthy, both mentally and physically. She economically can afford the baby. The life would not impact, would not, her life would not be impacted by being pregnant, whatever that means. Then, in that sense, I think most rabbis would say an abortion is not an option. But you see that I already added a few things to this discussion. Economic viability, 
uh, situation of mother and if she's married of parents, right? If she has a partner, uh, the mental health of the woman at the time and her physical health, okay? Let's say, I don't know, just give an example. I mean, women, women can get pregnant uh, later and later in life. Okay, I'll get to rape and incest too. Okay, yes. Um, uh, mental health, I'm, I'm talking about the mental health right now. So, so the um, women can get pregnant later and later in life. Some women might go off birth control thinking that the likelihood of getting pregnant is zero or near zero. So why bother taking the birth control, which has side effects on your body, when you don't have to anymore. And then boom, she get a, a 45 year old, 50 year old woman gets pregnant. Can happen, can happen. Then what do you do? Okay, so if she's healthy, is she healthy? Don't know. The older you are when you're pregnant, there are more possibilities of, um, of um, things going wrong with the pregnancy. And then just think about it. A 50 year old woman pregnant, She's 63 at the bar mitzvah. Okay, we live longer and longer, but still that there are issues that arise that could arise with pregnancy, all things being, so there's age of the mother, there's the economic circumstances of the mother, there's the mental health of the mother and emotional health of the mother. All these are considerations that most most rabbis today would take into consideration and allow an abortion to take place because it would have the pregnancy itself would have would have a negative impact on the emotional health of the mother and if it has a negative impact on the emotional health of the mother then it could have a negative impact on the physical health of the mother and it has a negative impact on the physical health of the mother, it could have a negative impact on the physical health of the fetus itself too, okay? Physical health of mother impacts health of fetus. What mother does, mother's a smoker, baby becomes a smoker by extension. Mother uh, is an alcoholic, the fetus becomes an alcoholic. Cocaine abuser, etc. you get the point? Whatever the mother does, it impacts the fetus. And therefore, the situ all, all aspects of the situation have to be taken into account in this discussion as to whether an abortion is permitted. So finally, about rape or incest. So, look, the, um, the Torah... The Torah prohibits, in chapter 18 of the book of Leviticus, has a list of prohibited sexual relations, okay? It does not talk about what happens if you have sexual relations in these forbidden relationships, and then the woman becomes pregnant. The Torah does not talk about that. The rabbis do. And so, um, unfortunately, I am not up on these, these laws about what happens if a man um, ha, uh, uh, has sexual relations with his daughter, with his sister, with his mother, with his mother-in-law, all the other forbidden, his aunts, all these other forbidden relations. What happens then should the, a woman carry the child to term? So the, um, the rabbis referred, there is a term for the child born of this relationship. And so that is a, uh, that is a mom's there. So a child is, uh, that is born of, an, of a, such an illegal relationship has the, uh, the label of being a mom's there. So for the rabbis, abortion, abortion wasn't an option. They just did not know of medical procedures that could be done 1,500 years ago to abort a baby. 
at least safely. Okay, I, I, I think we do know from Egyptian uh, sources from uh, a couple thousand years ago about cesarean sections. Okay, so, but, but I have no idea if uh, the rabbis living under Roman empire rule in the land of Israel, whether from the, in the Roman empire, C-sections were an option then. And even if they were, how safe were they, right? There's no such thing as sterilization as we know it in, in that time. So abortion is not, is not an option that the rabbis consider at the time. So the, most of the discussion that we're having about abortion is really based on principles that the rabbis were talking about. And what I, what I was saying, the relative value of life, viability of life, and the pursuer. And the only example they give of abortion, as we know it, is this example of childbirth of hacking the baby to pieces as it's being born in order to save the mother's life. That's, that's in the conversation of abortion can be used as abortion. And the only other example, which I didn't bring up from Exodus 21, uh, Exodus chapter 21, verse 22, when two people are having a fight and there happens to be a pregnant woman nearby and in the course of the fight, they punch the baby, the, the woman's belly forcing a miscarriage, they pay the monetary value of, of injury to the woman. So that, so that causing the woman to have a miscarriage there, that also enters into the discussion about the, about, there's nothing in the Torah about saying that you kill the baby. Those two men killed the baby. They were causing a miscarriage, which caused harm to the mother. So you pay monetary monetary compensation for the injury, okay? So for the rabbis then, so rape and incest would enter the category of, of uh, mental and emotional health of the mother, the pregnant woman having to undergo pregnancy, having to live through pregnancy, uh, knowing what, the, what, what caused the pregnancy. And so that from, uh, I'd say 99% of rabbis today would say abortion for that absolutely permitted. So um, it's 11.48. I think I've, I've given, so, so again, I, I, want, I just want to reinforce a couple of points. Jewish law and, and this discussion about Jewish religious ethics is all about interpretation and nuance. Always has been. Jewish law is always nuanced. There is no such thing as a blanket statement in Jewish law. It's always nuanced. And that is absolutely um, foundational to understanding our religious system. Nuance is part of a religious system. That's number one. And then specifically when it comes to abortion, Pro-life, pro-choice are not fair to have these blanket statements to say, as Jews, are we pro-life or pro-choice? It's, again, it's nuanced, so it's not fair to, to fall under one category or another. And thirdly, the issues then are about relative value of life, that there's not an equivalency of life across the board, relative value of life, the viability of life, and also the idea of a pursuer. So Laurie asks in the chat, how might an orthodox approach differ from conservative in modern times? Uh, not too much, really, not too much. Um, I would think uh, especially modern orthodox rabbis and conservative rabbis would have very, very similar opinions when it comes to, when it comes to this issue of abortion, absolutely. And um, that, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, there, the I, I can't think of, of too many circumstances in the whole abortion uh, discussion where, uh, where a modern Orthodox rabbi would have a different opinion than a conservative rabbi. Because we're both based on the halachic system 
It's just, you know, mostly conservative rabbis are willing to go further in the interpretation than, than orthodox. But when it comes to abortion, we're pretty, we're pretty much on the same, pretty much on the same page. Uh, Sylvia, uh, unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, you are. Go ahead. Yes. Um, in my memory, speaking to the Christian people, Christian women, this is so completely opposite. Yes. Am I correct? Am I correct in remembering that they said that it's the you save the the child before you save the mother? So <laughs> I don't. So I don't know. I don't know. But, but according so the the little that I know, again, uh, and this is according to Catholic understanding, and I, it might be all Christian understanding. Life begins at conception, right? And not just that. Number two, that life in the womb is equal in value of the mother's life, okay? So two things that Judaism disagrees with. Life does not begin at conception. Life begins either as soon as a baby is born or 31 days after the birth, okay? So that's the difference. That's a major difference. Very much And so. also the equivalency. There's no such thing as a, nobody, a, a Jew, a Jew, and just using Hitler as an example, no one would say that Hitler's life is as valuable as anybody else's life here. Everybody would agree that Hitler's life is, is worthless. Okay, so that it would, if, if, if we were in a, in a situation like Hitler's generals were with an attempt on his life, if during World War II, if we were in a situation where we could assassinate Hitler, absolutely, absolutely would be permitted, if not mandated by Jewish law, to assassinate Hitler. But according to Christian law, no. Hitler, despite the fact that he's a devil, the Christians would agree that he's a devil, despite that he's a human being and his life is equivalent to yours and my life. Okay, so that's absurd. Yes. Uh, so again, uh, we we have value judgments that we make, and we shouldn't make those value judgments because, in the end, we are just doing our best to understand how to live life and understanding these definitions and making these definitions. Okay, so our understanding of of different values of life and the viability of life and the fact that there's pursuers right and, and, and also understanding the sixth the sixth commandment as do not murder as opposed to do not kill and it's not understanding it it's that's the word the right. word itself means do not murder allows for all of these all of this nuance which allows for us to make it through life every day because if we had the, the Blanket statements don't allow us to move through life. So that that's so so the, the rabbis the, the rabbis it's it's all about the high by him live by these laws and the rabbis provide us the nuance in order to live our lives. Well, I'm, I'm grateful that our people are so smart. Well, so again, but Sylvia, Sylvia, the the, the issue the problem is that the Christians who understand life in this way are imposing, are trying to impose their religious belief on all Americans. Right. That's the problem. And Absolutely. secondly, secondly, a lot of those people who want to impose their Christian perspective on life into all Americans also think a lot of them that America is a Christian country. Right. Okay. So you have that, those two points that make it very difficult for non Christians to be able to enter into a discussion with these pro lifers. Right. Okay. So now, another question here from Margie or Steve I think Catholics be uh, believe save the baby because the mother has already been baptized and will go to heaven but the baby had not been baptized yet. That could very well be, and again, I'm not Catholic, I'm not Christian, I don't know the, the ins and outs, but that sounds right. That sounds right. 
Okay. Any other, uh, Robert, do you have a question? Yes. Question. Yeah. Going back to the rape incest, I, I know in Leviticus, you know, I had to look it up. Not that I didn't trust you, but I just wanted to refresh my yeah, memory. Yeah. It lists all the things that, you know, is a sin. You don't lay with your aunt, right. or your sister, et cetera. But in the case of rape. Yes. Or incest. Yes. Which is going to cause emotional harm. Right. Then it's okay for an abortion in Jewish law. So again, again, abortion, so the rabbis don't talk about abortion as an option in cases of rape or incest. When they talk about rape and incest, and they do talk about it, they only talk about what the bait, what, how to take care of the woman, what the punishment would be to the perpetrator. They would also talk about punishment to the woman too. And this is, this is so, so terrible to, because the rabbis, the rabbi being men, I uh, think that there's consent. So if a woman consents in the pro in the process of being raped, then a woman would be would be uh, would be punished as well. So there, there's there's punishment for men and women for engaging in this illicit sexual relationship, and then there's the stigma attached to the child who is born of this relationship. Yeah, you, you said but, but abortion, abortion in the in the mission and the Talmud is not an option here. Later, later, it, it only becomes an option at, in Jewish discussion when abortion becomes a viable um, medical procedure. So, and that became a viable medical procedure in the 50s and 60s, right? So it's only yeah. 70 years. So within the past 70 years, we've, we've been able then as Jews to apply this new medical procedure to this discussion and apply it to the rape and incest and say for most rabbis that if a woman is raped or uh, was subject to incest, then yes, abortion is an option. And that most rabbis would agree with that. And okay? you use the term "momzer." Yes. I always thought "momzer" was just like calling somebody a jerk. Yeah, it, right. In Yiddish, it is, but in, in for the rabbis, it's a technical term. The child, uh, uh, so it's like "bastard" in in English. You can call someone a bastard, but in in rabbinic uh, in rabbinic law, or no, in in American law, a "bastard." it fits a particular definition, right? What, what is a, a child who is a product of a, of a particular uh, relationship is a bastard. And what, what is that particular relationship? So the same with moms there, a child of an illicit relationship becomes a moms there and is only allowed to marry another moms there. I thought it was just like a schnorr. Right, <laughs> it's more than that. It's, it's, a, it's a jerk, but it's, but yes, okay. Um, any other, it's 1158. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so we had, um, it's, it's a difficult topic and a, a lot more can be said about it. And I thought we've, uh, hopefully we've um, come away with the lessons I wanted us to come away with. That nuance is an important part, is part and parcel of Jewish law and Jewish ethics. And it's okay to be nuanced. And in fact, more than okay, it's, it's, the, it's the way to do, to, to do it. And that, uh, or about the issue of abortion itself, there's they, there are different values of life, viability of life, and the issue of the pursuer. All right, have a good rest of the day, everybody. See you all next Monday and next Jews and the news. Thank you. Thank you.